Good morning, good morning. Good to see everyone, good to see everyone so engaged um, in conversation. And um, we, we'll, do, we'll just have a little show of hands, if we are, of the people who'd like to claim credit for arranging the weather this morning. All right? That's, that's great. So um, good morning. I'm, I'm David Cohen, the chair of the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania. It's my uh, pleasure to welcome you here all this morning. Um, on behalf of the trustees, I, I hope you're having a great alumni weekend, and um, I have to say, yeah. that, yep. Um, Leon Hoops, I have to say, what an incredible agenda. I mean, they're just, they're just a fabulous weekend. If you can't find something here that, uh, that tickles your fancy, then, um, then, then I think the problem is on your side and not, and not on <laughs> our side. And one of, the, one of the great things, I think, about Alumni Weekend is that, sure, there's the social part, reconnecting with friends and classmates, but it's also an opportunity to enable you to reconnect to the university. And um, connections are a, are a lot about what this university is all about. And um, by being here uh, this weekend, by being here today, you've shown yourself to be fully connected to the university. And I think that's one of the great values um, that we create in the university and that we create in the society as a whole. Um, I know I speak on behalf of all of the trustees when I say that great things are happening here at Penn. And uh, the a main reason for that is the leadership that we get from our president, Amy Gutman. Um, that's also <laughs> one of the Even before Amy, I think our founder um, set forth the vision for Penn, and that vision basically is to create knowledge for the benefit of society, if you want to put it down into a single phrase. Uh, that was Franklin's ideal, and I think it's what we strive to do um, at this university each and every day. Um, Amy has really ad advanced this principle and put it in a 21st century context, starting with her, her inauguration message, but really throughout um, her five years as the, as the president of Penn. And what she's talked about is the need to increase access, to integrate academic disciplines, and then to foster local and global engagement, um, all with the goal of making Penn both eminent and relevant. And again, notice the concept of connection there, because it is our connection to, to communities locally, nationally, and globally that I think distinguish Penn and make a, and give us our competitive advantage. So while I'm okay with sort of synthesizing those <laughs> thoughts down into a few sentences, I don't think anyone can articulate this vision with more passion and energy um, than Amy Gutman, and it's my pleasure to introduce her to you this morning and turn the podium over to her. Amy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see all of you here, and thank you so much, David. David Cohn is the lead volunteer of our amazing team at Penn, and I just ask you all to give him a big round of applause. He's fabulous. And I'm also blessed, and you are also blessed, to have here the head of Penn Alumni Worldwide, Lee Spellman Doty. Lee, would you stand so everyone can see you? So welcome back to campus, everyone. How's it been so far? Good? Yeah, good. So I've noticed through my life that among all the things that are good for you, fresh fruit and vegetables, very good. Sleep, which I keep telling our students, get more, more sleep a good book, and not to be forgotten, chocolate. Um, but the top of my list, staying connected to Penn. And for proof, I want you to look no further than the young man who is in the second row here um, celebrating his 75th reunion. Please join, wait, 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 let you hear it, and then reserve it, but not for long. Join me in saluting class of 1935, Milton Skarloff. Milton? Right here. I have to 
tell you, if that isn't amazing enough, Milton is wearing his class of 1935 sweater from 1935, and it fits, it, it fits him like a glove, which is really great. Alongside Milton are five proud Penn alums celebrating their 70th. Actually, there are three. I met five, but three are here with us, celebrating their 70th reunion from the class of 1940. Please join me in welcoming back to Penn Jean Martin McCorkle, Daniel Mason, and Albert Klein. you all make it. <laughs> so much has changed in the world and at Penn since the graduation of the great class, uh, these classes, but even the great class of 2005. That was the class of my first, my first graduating class at Penn. Let me tell you a few things that have changed just since 2005. Text and friend became verbs. Defriending entered the lexicon. And the Phillies won the World Series. Let's hear it for the Phillies. Also, Penn became a national powerhouse in women's lacrosse. Some th and our women's lacrosse team is, is fabulous. Um, and our men's basketball team is going to become fabulous again. Mark my words. Some things haven't changed. Penn retains its timeless beauty and its magic. The Fisher Fine Arts Library still glows inside and out. There you go. And the palestra still reigns as the cathedral of college basketball. I'm sure that you also find it exhilarating to see how much has changed at Penn since you graduated. And, um, I have had, I won't tell you all my sins in life, but one of my sins is that I didn't graduate from Penn. <laughs> but I was made an honorary member, an honorary alumna, um, by Lee Spellman Doty and the Alumni Association. So I hope I'm atoning for my sins um, because of all the things that I find most exhilarating in my life, being president of this great university is at the very top. The only thing that even competes with it are my family and friends. And now, the vast majority of my friends are here at Penn. So it's really amazing. And David said what we're trying to do in a capsule, which is take advantage of Penn's amazing momentum and increase access for the very most talented and hardworking students, integrate knowledge across our beautiful campus, which has 12 amazing schools on one gorgeous urban campus, and show, really demonstrate, the impact of the knowledge created at this university on society. The impact both of our research and of, above all, the leaders that we produce. And you are a very important part of that. This past year alone marked several important milestones, especially in financial aid, of which we're very proud. Last September, for the first time in Penn's 270-year wonderful history, we fully implemented our historic no-loan financial aid policy. Students from typical families with incomes less than $90,000 will pay no tuition and fees at Penn. Every Penn undergraduate with demonstrated financial need now attends Penn loan free. That is an amazing milestone and we're very proud. Thank you. Penn scholarships are more valuable than ever. I still remember the email that
that a young woman sent to us when she learned she got into Penn with a full scholarship. And she said when she told her father that she had gotten in, her father started crying. And she had never seen her father cry. And he said, I thought before this happened that I'd have to pick up and go back to Mexico because our loan burden was so great. And I knew I wanted you to get into a great university, but I also knew I couldn't afford it. And she ended the email by telling me that her father ended what he said to her through his tears with the following words, now I know what the everlasting American dream is all about. It doesn't get much better than that, and I thank each and every one of you who have contributed to Penn for making our financial aid po policy possible. Thank you so very, very much for that. At the same time as we are in continuing to increase financial assistance for undergraduates, we're also continuing to increase it for our graduate and professional students. A fundraising priority for our Making History campaign has really taken off, and we are $222 million towards our $323 million goal for graduate and, and professional students. Keeping Penn affordable allows us to educate the most talented students. And as you know, the two ingredients of a great university are its students and its faculty. So under the second principle of the Penn Compact, integrating knowledge, we have launched major initiatives to encourage greater collaboration across multiple professions and academic disciplines. In 2005, we established the Penn Integrates Knowledge Professorships, and we began appointing exceptional teacher scholars who would fortify our interdisciplinary eminence. And many students come to Penn because of our interdisciplinary strength. We now have 10 PIC professors. We call them PIC professors because, I can't say this, but I will. They're the pick of the litter, right? They're the best. Excuse me for that pun. They inspire students and colleagues alike, and they're making history throughout our university. Pick, let me just give you one example. Pick Professor John Marino is an eminent medical ethicist who is hugely influential in a broad variety of areas. He has studied the complicated relationship between science and politics. He has written and spoken extensively about stem cell research and the uses of neuroscience in the military and intelligence communities. And if any of you have seen 60 Minutes recently, this is the hottest area of the intersection between ethics and science. And John recognizes that we're in the midst of a radical sea change. And he really inspires as well as educates students when he says, we're going to more directly change our bodies and our brains and our minds than any other generation of human beings. The critical questions become, how much do we change ourselves? What are the values that we bring to bear on this change? You and I may have thought that caffeine and chocolate were the way to stimulate our minds and bodies, but now there are ways with medicines and machines that were not known even to my generation. And John is making a huge difference in bringing knowledge of science and ethics together. This PIC initiative has a galvanizing impact through Penn. Through a new $50 million neuroscience initiative, we will add five more PIC professors to Penn and really lead the revolution in brain sciences. Do you know what organ is the organ in our body we know least about? The brain. And that is really critical for us in, into the future. We know a lot more about other parts of our body than the brain. So our neuroscience initiative is going to lead the way in a responsible understanding of how we deal with our increasing and importantly increasing knowledge of the human brain. So now I want to describe, because you're here on our campus, I want to describe 
just how we are transforming our campus. And this is going to, once you leave this auditorium, literally be before your eyes. And so I'm going to give you a little preview of what's going on. And then when you leave, at, before you leave Penn for this weekend, make sure you take a look at this live. Um, as you would guess, the economic downturn forced many colleges and universities to freeze major building and renovation projects indefinitely. There were some projects at our peer institutions that were billion dollar projects and they were literally just stopped in the construct, before the, the pre-construct, the digging phase. We have not had to stop any of our major projects. Thank you. <laughs> so let me tell you what we're doing. By marshalling our resources strategically, we have moved full speed ahead to create the ultimate urban campus. And David told you that one of the big themes at Penn is connecting. You are connecting with your classmates. You are connecting across classes. You are connecting to Penn's history and our legacy moving forward. Our campus plan is called Penn Connects. And let me just give you an insight in what we're doing. For starters, we are close to completing the most integrated health complex in the world. Already up and running are the Ruth and Raymond Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine, which offers the finest cancer and heart care on the East Coast. I hope none of you needs it, but if any of you does, you can't do better than to come to the Perlman Center. Um, the world's largest proton therapy center, the world's largest proton therapy center, named for Ralph and Brian Roberts and their family. This proton therapy center is not only the largest, but it's the only one that is going to be collecting data to really test the true efficacy of proton therapy. And for those of you who don't know about proton therapy, the most important thing to know about it is it's so targeted at cancer cells that it minimizes the collateral damage. So it's often the therapy of choice for children, and it's also the therapy of choice for many other, increasingly other, cancers. We look forward to completing the integration of this medical complex very soon, next year, by opening the Translational Research Center which will accelerate the pace at which we convert lab discoveries into effective new medical therapies. This will make Penn the premier place for bench-to-bedside medicine. Now, we also opened a stunning new 53,000 square foot home for the Annenberg Public Policy Center. And in addition, we completed a beautiful renovation of what was once an antiquated music building and now is the most beautiful connection between the traditional and the new at Penn. We restored the brickwork on the music building and we added a beautiful glass extension in the back as well. And I hope you have already walked by, but if you haven't, you must walk by Franklin Field's Northern Arcade to see us putting the finishing touches on the George Weiss Pavilion, which features a fabulous fitness center and weight training room for our great student athletes and will also soon have study space for our students in it as well. This arcade, for those of you who were here any time in the past. This arcade used to be characterized by having lots of ugly cars and trucks parked within it. And now it has beautiful 50 and 70 foot high glass windows in the arches. We are also moving full steam ahead with many more beautiful pen spaces. This fall at the 3200 block of Walnut Street, we will break ground on the Krishna Singh Nano Technology Center. This is the first building to integrate the faculties of two schools 
engineering, and arts and sciences. The most visible manifestation of our commitment to create the ultimate urban campus is Penn Park. That's not it yet, is it? <laughs> we are converting what was a massive, ugly parking lot into 24 acres of green space, athletic fields, and recreation facilities. Here's a close-up view of the work we're doing right now. My husband calls those Amy's Mountains, the mountains of dirt. Here's what Penn Park ultimately will look like two years from now. Increasing Penn's total green space by more than 20% underscores our resolve to be the greenest urban campus in the nation. As we create Penn Park and reduce our carbon footprint, we continue to deepen our ties with our neighbors to make West Philadelphia a vibrant neighborhood in which to live, to work, and to raise a family. Each year, we generate $6 billion of economic impact in and around the city of Philadelphia. We prepare our students for service leadership through our Civic Scholars Program, through our Fox Leadership Program, and the Netter Center for Community Partnerships. This year, I'm very proud to say, we were named number one good neighbor among all the nation's colleges and universities. We <laughs> we're also building partnerships around the globe. Last March, I traveled to China with a wonderful Penn delegation and I signed new teaching and research partnerships with two of the premier Chinese universities. I also met with hundreds, literally hundreds, of Penn alumni and parents at events in Beijing and Shanghai, including a reception at the U.S. Embassy hosted by Penn alumnus and current U.S. Ambassador to China, John Huntsman, Jr., who will be our commencement speaker this year. John gave a wonderful, rousing speech at the embassy to an overflowing crowd, saying he had just had Colin Powell there the night before, and the Penn delegation was even greater than the delegation to see Colin Powell. Our engagement with Penn around the world has never been greater. Increasing access, integrating knowledge, and strengthening local and global engagement all serve one overarching goal, to educate great future leaders. No trend better illustrates our rise to eminence and our momentum than the excellence, diversity, and accomplishments of our students and faculty. In 2004, when I began, no one could see the global economic crisis on the horizon. Yet Penn was poised to emerge from this crisis an ever more eminent university for at least two reasons. First, we have been strategic in our vision and prudent in our financial planning. We didn't start any building project without a sound financial plan. We began a no-loan, all-grant financial aid policy with the support of our trustees and a sound financial plan. So unlike some of our peers, we have been able to forge full steam ahead with that. That's the first reason. The second reason is at least as important. Your engagement with Penn has made it possible for us to get stronger and stronger. I have said this more than once and I will say it again. Our strongest asset is our people, and our, the loyalty and engagement and enthusiasm of Penn alumni worldwide. Wherever I go, I meet Penn alums, and wherever I go, they ask me, what's happening back there? Why is there so much buzz about Penn? And they also often say, when they read that we had, for example, 27,000 applications to our undergraduate colleges, 
I couldn't get into Penn today. And I smile and I ask them to talk to our Dean of Admissions, who will, of course, confirm that in many cases. <laughs> um, but they realize that that's a reason to be all the prouder of Penn. Your diploma is all the more valuable today than ever before. But seriously, we could not have our all-grant, no-loan policy were it not for the support of all your reunion classes. This year's reunion classes set amazing records. Let me just give you one. This year, our reunion classes have raised $74 million, representing a 54% increase over five years ago. That is amazing. $13 million of those funds, and counting, have been directed towards undergraduate financial aid. That's why we can do what we're doing. So once we have all the numbers for the graduate reunion classes, I am sure you, too, will manage to set new records. So not only, as I said at the outset, is staying close to Penn good for you, it is also essential to Penn's vitality going forward. The more you stay involved with Penn in any way, the stronger Penn will grow. I find that my love for Penn just keeps growing stronger every day. And when I say Penn, I mean Penn's extended family. I am blessed with a great family, but it's a very small family. And now I'm blessed with a great family that's also great in numerical terms. When I was in a safari in India, um, this was my second year as Penn's president, and I was on an official trip to India, and I went on a safari looking for a very rare tiger in Rantambur. And dusk was falling and couldn't find the tiger in a jeep, wrapped. It was, as those of you who have been on safaris know, it gets cold as the sun's going down, wrapped um, with my pen cap on, and sitting, figuring out the new route to take, maybe to find this tiger. And in the jeep next to me, I he a young, very attractive young woman bends out and says, are you President Gutman? My father is a donor to the wildlife preserve here. Come in our Jeep. We'll find you the tiger. <laughs> and sure enough, I found the tiger. Why? Because of my extended Penn family. <laughs> and that happens to me week in and week out. Not always in a safari in India, but all, all over. Penn simply pulses with 270 years of history that we have all helped to make. And we're just getting warmed up. By staying connected to your alma mater, you will help to write an ever more glorious chapter in Penn's history. So I just want to thank every one of you, and I want to leave time for questions. So I just want to end by saying, go Quakers, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So as you know, I love to take questions. So who would like to begin? <laughs> See? Oh, OK. Oh. But the important thing was, was how few there were and how relatively insignificant they were compared to some of our friends. How are we able to keep those big mistakes down? Is it risk management? Is good general management? Are we lucky? Do we have any, any process there to help us back with our Thank you. Um, it's a great question. And it's a great question. I've never been asked that question. Um, <laughs> so. First and foremost, 
I think we have a great team. Uh, we have a great group of trustees and alum volunteer alumni leaders. And as far as what we do here on the ground, we do really um, excel in keeping uh, risks down, but as important, um, keeping our eye on the ball strategically. And as you all know, their um, universities aren't renowned for moving quickly. I like to say we all have eminent math departments, but we're much better at adding than subtracting, for example. And I love my favorite story um, was told to me uh, actually by a former president of the University of Chicago who said, being a university president is little like being a cemetery groundskeeper. You preside over a lot of people, but you can't get them to do very much. <laughs> so I have to tell you that my team and our faculty does a huge amount. Our faculty cares tremendously about teaching as well as research. Our professional faculty have their eye on what the most important <laughs> issues are, and I think the key, in addition to having a great team, is that we have taken Benjamin Franklin's formula into the 21st century about integrating knowledge and putting it into practice for the service of society. We begin it right here at home in West Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is showing what we can do for our city and state and region, and then we also take it as far as not only Washington and this country, where we're hugely influential now, and I'm very proud to be chairing the President's Commission on Bioethics. Well, we haven't done anything yet, so I <laughs> take no credit for being influential, but to places like China and India. So I would say strategic vision and keen management are, are the keys, and you can only do it with a great team. Thank you for that wonderful question. Yes. Hi, uh, I recently read Stand up, please. Okay. I recently read that uh, tuition costs at Penn have, and the cost of just attending as an undergraduate have, have now reached 50000 a year. Why are higher education costs such as these expanding at so much greater than the rate of everything else in this country? Do you foresee that trajectory continuing, and can anything be done to control it? Right. Good question. And I have heard that question before. <laughs> you, you won't be surprised, but it's a very important question. Um, higher education costs traditionally go up at more than the consumer price index because our bundle of goods, half of our bundle of goods are people. And the bundle of goods in the consumer price index is, is lower. Um, it increases at a lower, lower rate. So typically, university costs increase at about 2% more than the CPI. However, the key at Penn to keeping costs down are two. There are two keys. One is that we really do state-of-the-art um, purchasing and keeping our administrative costs down. So the Lombardi Report, which rates colleges and universities, gives us the highest grade on administrative efficiency. The second key is that we have increased financial aid for all students. Every undergraduate with demonstrated financial need gets their full need um, supplied by our financial aid budget. And we have increased financial aid by far more than we have incre increased tuition, room, and board. So and our financial aid goes to families who earn up to approximately $200,000 a year. So this is financial aid for middle income as well as low income students. And we're committed to that. And one of the things we're really proud of is that during the hard economic times, Penn has become more affordable to all families. And that's why we saw this year, one of the reasons why we saw a 17% increase in applications to Penn um, to the College of Arts and Sciences, to Wharton, to nursing and engineering. So we do a lot to control costs, 
but we do even more to make sure that every student who can otherwise not afford to come to Penn can afford it and now can afford to graduate loan free. Yes? Take the, take the mic, please. <laughs> For many years, the endowment uh, dramatically underperformed our peers, and they got all the press for going into alternatives, real estate, hedge funds, et cetera. And then when the downturn came, we dramatically outperformed our peers by losing much less. Where are we now? Very good question. So let me begin with the downturn. In the downturn, Several alums came up to me and said, do you ever think we would be congratulating you for being down only 15.7%? That's what we were down. We were down the least in the downturn. And I give great credit to our chief investment officer and our investment office and our trustee investment committee headed by Howard Marks. They did a great job. And that I begin there because that is key, a key, to our increasing strength moving forward. In fact, Kristen Gilbertson, our chief investment officer, will this coming week get the investor, the institutional investor of the year award. Um, this, and now fast forward to now, as of December, 30th, the end of the calendar year, which is not the end of our fiscal year. Our fiscal year ends, let me pull it up actually, as of the end of the third quarter, the end of March of our fiscal year, we're up 17.1%. So we're doing extraordinarily well. And I have to say, as much as I heard what you began with when I began as president, now I hear one compliment after another about how well our investment office is doing and how much outreach they're doing. It is great to have the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, and we're taking advantage of it for the University of Pennsylvania's endowment as well. Yes. <laughs> so the question, since you didn't have a mic, but you projected very well, but just in case you didn't hear it up there, is how can students maximize their chances of getting into Penn, since um, it's so desired? Um, is our dean of admissions here? Uh, our dean of admissions would basically say the following, which is what I tell parents and students when they ask. Follow your passions. Don't try to do everything. Work incredibly hard. Um, and basically after that, it's, you know, you just have to wait and see what, whether you're going to get in. We, we have more qualified students than we can accept. Let me tell you a couple of other things that I think will be important to all of you. One is we stand by our early decision program. And we tell people that if you are a legacy, you will get preference in early decision. You still have to be a great student. But we do maintain a, high level, a higher level of legacy acceptances than the you know, acceptances of students who are not legacies. Um, after that, one of the things I'm very proud of is we don't have a formula. We don't say you score X amount on the SATs or the GPA and you'll get in or you won't get in. We really are looking to create a fabulously talented, diverse, dynamic, entrepreneurial set of the people who will make us proud of being Benjamin Franklin's university. One yeah, more, one more question. What, okay. There was, yes. 
I was just curious, do you have any projects beyond the current planning horizon? In other words, not in the strategic plan, but things that you're entertaining and haven't been voiced yet that you'd like to see happen. That would be curious to me. So what's not in the strategic plan <laughs> that I would like to see happen? Um, you know, one of the great features of the University of Pennsylvania is that we are breaking down the walls that have previously existed and exist in other universities between liberal arts and sciences and professional education. And with the PIC professors and with our nanoscience and technology building and with all of you here back on campus from all of our different schools. My vision and my dream is that the University of Pennsylvania not only ranks highest in everything we do, and by the way, we have the greatest number of ranked programs of any college and university in this country, but that we become a model for the future of higher education in this country and the world. Because in the 19th century, education was very generalized. In the 20th century, it was very specialized. In the 21st century, we have to bring that together. And the reason our graduates are doing so well is because everybody in the so-called real world knows that you have to be both creative and you have to know something very well. So my vision for the University of Pennsylvania is to be a leader in this integration of knowledge in service of society and the world. And since you asked the last question, I'm going to say to all of you, go out there, be ambassadors for Penn, not only because you're proud of being a Quaker and being you know, bleeding red and blue, but also because we represent the future of what higher education can contribute to our city, to our society, and the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you.